Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. I'm going to talk to us for a while today on the topic, Preaching to the Choir. Preaching to the Choir. Luke 15, verses 1 through 7. And the Word of God today reads, from the King James text, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, what man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. If you bow your heads with me one more moment, Father, once again, God, we bow our heads before you, we humble ourselves in your presence. The word of God must go forth, it must go forth in power, it must go forth with authority, it must go forth with love that it might accomplish the end, the task for which it would be set. Master, in the name of Jesus, use this old preacher today, God. Use me, Lord, as your oracle. Use me as your mouthpiece. Anoint with the Holy Ghost. Oh, God, how I know the need for the anointing and how I rely upon that anointing to do the work you've called me to do. In and of myself, O oh God, there is nothing I have to offer, but the anointing can take a sow's ear and turn it into a silk purse. Allow my words today, Lord, to be medicine for the ears of those that would hear, let salvation come to the lost, healing to the sick, strength to those today, God, who are beaten down and ostracized and rejected. Oh, Master, help to those today who are engaged in struggle. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise amen. God and amen. Hallelujah. Preaching to the choir. In our primary text today, I read in the first couple of verses something that is striking. When the Lord laid this message on my heart this week, <laughs> Tommy and I were out doing something, and the Spirit of the Lord was talking to my heart. And I took my phone, and I had to, you know, that talk to text. Uh -huh. And I needed to put a little note in there as to what the inspiration God had given me. See, the Lord gives me Scripture for my messages without me ever reading it. He'll literally, every single time, this is how God works. I read my Bible every day, but I never preach from what I've read during the week. Never happens that way. 
God literally just dropped something in my spirit. So I said to Tommy, I said, hold on a minute. i got to put a note in my phone. God's given me my message for the week. And I spoke into my phone and I said, then drew near unto him. All the publicans and sinners for to hear him. That's all I needed. That was, I knew that was my primary text. Thank God, Jesus never became distracted. Thank God, Jesus never allowed himself to lose sight of his mission and his purpose as a man. Thank God he never allowed circumstances and situations around him to affect him in such a way that he forgot even momentarily what he had come to do. Listen to that text today. Then drew near unto him. Whew. I feel the Holy Ghost. <laughs> of course, I know what I'm about to say, but then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Oh, glory. Oh, God, that we would have a church that I would preach a message that publicans and sinners would want to hear. Hallelujah. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Oh my God, wouldn't it be wonderful today if the church had filled up this morning with sinners and unbelievers and those who have never known God. See, they had heard about the message of Christ and they had heard about his actions. They had heard about things he had done. And even the sinner, hallelujah, even the unbeliever, even the publicans, people with bad reputations for doing bad things, wanted to be near him. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, we got churches in America today. We got churches around the world. And every Sunday, the only people that have any desire whatsoever to walk into that church building are church people. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they've heard about your message and they've heard about your actions. They know all about your works. And they know all about what you preach. They've heard it second hand, third hand, passed down from neighbors and friends. They've heard it from church members who are part of your church. They've heard what you preach. And honey, they ain't interested. They're not the least bit interested in learning more. They're not the least bit interested in hearing anymore. You've already offended them. You've already turned them off. You've already pushed them away. You've already ostracized them. And they've never even been in your church. And like foolish people, you try to tell me you're doing the work of God. No, you're not. No, you're not. Jesus never lost sight of his mission. He said, the Son of Man is come to do what? To offend, to preach holiness, to engage in culture war. No, he said, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Oh, aren't you glad today Jesus never lost sight of his, of his purpose? Mm -hmm. 
Hallelujah. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes, all the religious crowd, murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Oh, the worst thing in the world you can do is keep company with sinners. But Jesus didn't just keep company with them. He didn't seek them out, but they sought him out. That's why they said he receiveth sinners. See, he didn't go looking for them. They come looking for him. Mm -hmm. But he received them. Anybody. Oh, hallelujah. Anybody that wanted to walk into Jesus' church, <laughs> he let them in. Hallelujah. He didn't stand at the door and say, Lady, your hair isn't long enough. Lady, you're wearing pants, and we don't wear pants in our church. The ladies, that is. Mister, you come across like a queer. We don't let queers in our church. Sir, you've got alcohol on your breath. We don't believe in drinking, so you're not welcome in our church. No, he receives sinners. Oh, aren't you glad today he yes. receiveth sinners? Yes. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad today? He never lost sight of his mission. And his mission required that he receiveth sinners. I got news for you today. The church has a similar mission. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. Yes. Fool, you can't preach the gospel to a bunch of people who are already saved. Mm -hmm. You got to preach the gospel for the benefit of the lost. And if you're going to preach the gospel for the benefit of the lost, then you better receive sinners. That's right. And you better be willing to eat with them. Mm -hmm. Oh no, that's too intimate. That's too close. That's too personal. I know. I'll, I'll draw the line at letting them come into church. But I'm not going to eat with them. Jesus was accused of receiving sinners and eating with them. Oh, my Lord. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, he said, I will come in, <laughs> Ooh, and I will sup with them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, Jesus doesn't just welcome you into his presence, but honey, he wants to get personal. He wants to get intimate. He wants to know you, and he wants you to know him. He's willing to sit down and dine with you. Hallelujah. Oh, my Lord, I feel God. I, I had a feeling I was going to feel something powerful in this message today, and I do. The church of Jesus Christ has become so distracted by its obsession with sin and sinners mm -hmm. that it has forgotten and neglected its primary mission. To preach the gospel to a lost world. Church services have become nothing more today than a passive aggressive means of airing our displeasure with the sins of the world. Hmm. We act like we're striving to keep the church clean. But the truth is we are preaching a message that has, or at least should have, little application for the people of God at all. Mm -hmm. You get up and preach about how horrible these sinners are, how horrible that sinners are, how God hates this sin and how God hates that sin. Oh, I'm preaching that! 
because I'm trying to keep the people of God pure. Honey, I'm going to tell you a little secret. That message shouldn't even have any application for your people. Mm -hmm. If you're preaching that garbage to your flock, then there's something wrong with your flock. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. If you're preaching about filth and dirt and misery and the miry clay to a bunch of born-again, spirit-filled, Jesus-named, baptized believers, then my God, what did you preach to them to begin with? Hmm. My Lord, have mercy. That message shouldn't even have any application for the people in your pew. Oh, but preachers get up every Sunday. I used to be there. I know what I'm talking about. The whole purpose is preach people into the altar to get them down there slobbering and snotting all over the altar. Oh, telling God how miserable they've been. Telling God how much they've fallen short. Well, problem is you don't understand grace. Problem is you don't preach grace. Problem is you don't tell the people of God instead of preaching against this, that, and the other thing. You ought to be helping your people to rejoice and to celebrate in the house of God that we wear the robe of righteousness that was sown by the Lord Jesus Christ out of the uh, temple curtains that once hung. God sees us as holy. God sees us as righteous. God sees us as pure. Because of his grace in response to our faith. If we preach that, people would be striving to live up to God's expectation. Are you hearing me today? Reminds me of the story of a man. I believe it was an Asian culture. A man went into the home of an Asian man one day to conduct business. And as he sat with this man, a beautiful young woman entered the room and brought tea and laid it down on the coffee table and offered to uh, pour some for the visitor and some for her husband. She was the man's wife. And when she left the room, the visitor said to his business acquaintance, he said, that is a beautiful woman. He said, my goodness, you have a lovely wife. She's beautiful. She's so gracious. She's so, uh, you know, um, yes, she is. Poised, elegant, graceful. You know, yes, you know, she has such poise and what have you. And that husband looked at his visitor and he said, yes, he said, I am so proud of her. He said, you know, in our culture, when you find a woman that you're interested in, you go to the father and you offer him something in the way of a dowry in exchange for the hand of his daughter in marriage. He said the more wealthy a man is, then sometimes he'll give a little more. Said, but one of the greatest offerings you can offer, one of the greatest dowries you can offer a father is a cow, because in our culture, People need cows and what have you, you know, to survive. So when you offer them a cow in exchange for their daughter's hand in marriage, that you're giving them a lot. He said, when I saw my wife-to-be, I fell so much in love with her and I could see she'd come from a poor family. She wasn't from wealth. She wasn't from privilege. I saw that there was so much potential in her for greatness. He said that I went to her father and I offered him ten cows. Ten cows. And the visitor said, my word, that father must have been flabbergasted by such a huge offering, such a huge dowry. 
And he said, he was. He, he said to me, are you sure you're talking about my daughter? She's so plain. She's such a simple girl. She doesn't have the social skills, you know, that a woman of privilege and wealth would have. And he said, I know who I'm talking about. And he gave ten cows for this young woman. Long story short, he married this woman. And I'm going to try to get right to the point. And she sought every day to live up to the dowry that he had given her father. Every day she strove to learn about social skills and hospitality. There's the word I was looking for earlier. She strove to learn more about hospitality. She would speak with other wives. She would try to learn everywhere she could learn. She tried to learn how to dress in a manner that was pretty and attractive. She learned how to apply makeup and how to make herself beautiful and how to fix her hair. But you see, it wasn't a matter of the cow, excuse me, the horse being in front of the cart. But the cart in front of the horse, the man offered a dowry based on what he knew she could be. Her knowing what he had done for her, she sought to live up to what he had done. If we preach the message in the church that God has called us to preach, then the people of God, instead of being told how ugly they are, and how plain they are, and how unhospitable they are, and how unattractive they are, and how they lack in social skills, and how they lack in this, and how they lack in that, if we preach the message of the gospel and the message of grace, as we're supposed to, the people of God will be encouraged to live up to what Christ did for us on the cross. Oh, that's a powerful thought, isn't it? We act like we're, we're trying to keep the church clean, but the truth is we're preaching a message that really has or should have little application for God's people at all. People fill the pews. So they can hear message after message, listen to me, about the other guy. Yeah. His faults, his failings, his sins, his abominations. Preach a message that actually educates believers in the word of God, in faith, in grace. And it encourages God's people to grow and live lives more capable of serving as a light in a dark world and you'll hear crickets in your sanctuary. Mm -hmm. How do I know? I've been doing it for decades. That's how I know. I'm telling you, I've had people come to our church. I've had people, non-LGBT people, and love it. Love it. We had a holiness lady come one time. She loved our church so much. She started coming. She brought her husband. She was hoping he'd want to come to our church. Oh, no, he wasn't going to have it. If you don't preach against sin, if you don't preach against this, if you don't preach against that, you're not doing the work of God. Uh, no. I'm doing the work of God. The problem is not my message. The problem is what you think the message ought to be. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, a lot of people go to church so they can be verbally and emotionally, spiritually assaulted Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. And these same foolish people believe that that is what the church experience is supposed to be. It's like a battered and abused wife. She comes to believe that she deserves the abuse, 
that she deserves to be battered. No, honey, you do not deserve to be. You deserve to be loved. You deserve to be cherished. You deserve to be nurtured. You deserve to be spoiled. If that man married you because he loved you, then there would be no abuse. There would be no misconduct. You preach grievance after grievance about the homosexual, about alcoholics, abortion doctors, women who seek abortions or vulgarity on television, and watch the pews and the offering plates quickly fill up. After all these messages have no impact on me, but rather point me to the sins of my neighbor. It's funny how preacher after preacher, church after church, call themselves preaching righteousness and godliness and holiness. And they preach against Roe versus Wade. They preach against abortion. Oh, this is not God's plan. God would have us to value human life. God would have us to do this. God would have us to do that. What you're doing is evil. We've got a bunch of idiots in America today that will vote for Satan as long as he claims to be pro-life. Mm -hmm. And they've done it. Not one time, Tommy, not one time will you ever hear one of these preachers preach against no-fault divorce. See, I'm of an age, I remember when for a couple to get a divorce, you had to have grounds. If you went in front of a judge and said, I just don't like him anymore, he ticks me off, we don't get along. The judge will look at you and say, well, I'm sorry for that, but you made a commitment for life, and that is not sufficient grounds to break your commitment. You need to go work that out. That's what they used to do. I'm only 55. This has been in my lifetime. At one time, in order to get a divorce, you had to prove adultery. Now, why is that? I'll tell you why. Because that's a biblical standard. In the Word of God, adultery was the only grounds, only grounds, whereby a man could divorce his wife. It's the only grounds was adultery. I got news for you, honey. That was part of the law of the land right up into my lifetime. Not only did you have to make the accusation of adultery, you had to prove the accusation of adultery. And that meant that if you knew, you ha and it, this is why back in the day, men and women used to hire private investigators to go and to photograph their partner having an affair, you know. But if you knew who the offending party was, who it is you're husband, your wife committed adultery with, you had to name them an open court. And that person would be subpoenaed. They'd be called into court. This was in my lifetime. But in my lifetime, state after state after state began to adopt what are referred to as no-fault divorce laws. Meaning, you can divorce your husband because you don't like the way he pulls up his zipper. You can divorce your wife because you don't like the way she wears her hair. There is no longer any burden of proof. There is no longer uh, the necessity of adultery or any other criteria. Nowadays, the most common excuse for divorce, reason for divorce, some would say, is listed as irreconcilable differences. That's it. State after state after state. I believe today most states, if not all states, have 
no-fault divorce laws on the books. Where are the preachers preaching against no-fault divorce? They preach against Roe versus Wade. That's the law of the land. Why are they not preaching against no-fault divorce? Do they believe that divorce is part of God's plan from the beginning? Because they got news for you. Jesus said it was not. Jesus said it was because of the hardness of your hearts that Moses made a provision for divorce on the grounds of adultery only. He said, but from the beginning, it was not so. Am I telling the mm -hmm. truth? Yep. See, if I had a church full of Pentecostal people right now that love truth, they'd be shouting amen. Because it's the truth, what I'm saying. Say, Pastor, what are you trying to say? What I'm trying to say is we got a bunch of hypocrite morons in the church running around claiming they're preaching against sin, claiming they're preaching against wrong, claiming they're preaching righteousness, claiming they're preaching holiness, when in fact they really are only preaching against their neighbor. They're preaching against the other guy. That's Half right. their congregation is divorced. God knows it, and they're not about to preach against divorce. They're not about to preach against no-fault divorce. They're not about to tell their congregation that the only biblical grounds for divorce is adultery. They're not about to do that because half the people in their congregation will get up and leave. Oh, you're willing to preach against the homosexual? Let them get up and leave. Let them wind up in the devil's hell because the church rejected them. But you're not willing to stand up for truth. When it comes to this crowd over here, because mm -hmm. half of them tithe and support the church. In Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. And he spake this parable unto certain, which trusted in themselves uh, that they were righteous, and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Well, he just described... Most church services today. Lord, I'm glad I'm not like these homosexuals in that gay pride parade. Oh God, I'm glad I'm not like that drunk down there at that bar. Oh God, I'm glad I'm not like this one, I'm not like that one. Am I telling the truth? Yes. yes. And oh, they'll preach Grace Oasis and our church members into hell because you can't be a child of God and be who you are. Oh, really? I don't believe that for one thing. For another thing, I come into the house of God and here's what I have to say. God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Lord, I'm too smart to look into your eyes and claim that I'm anything short of being a sinner saved by grace. Amen. I'm too smart, Lord. Mm -hmm. I know what the Apostle John said. If we say that we have no sin, we make God a liar. And the truth is not in us. 
I am with the Apostle Paul when he said, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I agree and I understand with the Apostle John when he said, Now are we called the sons of God, yet it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you, I come into the house of God, I'm not stupid enough to tell God I'm righteous. I'm not stupid enough to brag to God about how long my sleeves are, about how long my hair is, or about how I don't wear jewelry, or how I pay tithes. I'm not fool enough to do that, yes, Tommy, sir. because yes, I know according to the Word of God, you cannot trust in yourself that you're righteous. Mm -hmm. Lord said, which one of them goes home righteous? Oh, I'm going to tell you a little secret. Out of all the churches in Dallas today, guess how many people from Grace Oasis go home righteous compared to those at First Baptist? Hmm. Hallelujah. The message of the gospel is not a message of culture. Nor is it a message of conduct. For even the most righteous of cultures and godliest of conduct cannot secure eternal life without faith in the crucified and risen Christ. Do we even know the content anymore of the message of the gospel? Do we even know what the gospel is? Hmm. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul writes, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said, I didn't have all this great deep teaching. I didn't have all this great words of wisdom for you. He said, no, the only thing I was interested in knowing when I was talking to you and preaching to you was Jesus Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. In 1 Corinthians uh, 15 verses 1 through 7, Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. Semicolon. Verse 2. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. So Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel that I've preached to you, the gospel by which you've been saved. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Oh, hallelujah. And that he was seen of Cephas, which is the apostle Peter, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto the present, but some are fallen asleep. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. He said, you want to know what the gospel is? I'll tell you what the gospel is. Jesus Christ died, hallelujah. He was buried, hallelujah. And he rose yeah. again, hallelujah. hallelujah. We're headed for Resurrection Sunday. We're headed toward the day when we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord. Paul said, that's the message I've been preaching. That's the message you believed in. That's the message that'll save you unless you have believed in vain. What, Paul, you're not preaching? 
against sin. You're not preaching culture war. No, I'm preaching over and over again that Jesus Christ died, was buried, rose again, was seen of many witnesses. Why am I preaching that over and over again? So that you might maintain your faith, so your faith will stay intact. If there's anything in this world that's under attack today, it is faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not about baking cakes for gay weddings. thing that's going to save you is not that you refuse to bake a cake for a gay wedding. The thing that's going to save you is that you kept the faith to the very end. In Romans chapter 10 verses 8 through 15, the Apostle Paul writes, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, listen, the word of faith which we preach. What's the message that ought to be preached in the church? Paul said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him, hallelujah, shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich, unto all, or generous unto all, that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, that's what we're supposed to be preaching. That's the message we're supposed to be preaching. You're supposed to keep your faith. You're supposed to keep professing. And you're supposed to keep believing in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. Listen to this now. Paul writes in verse 14, Romans chapter 8. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The Lord Jesus Christ in our primary text, by both his word and his actions, his deeds, attracted sinners. They wanted to be near him. They wanted to hear his message. When is the last time you heard of a church that actually drew in unbelievers and sinners mm. by reason of their message and their conduct toward them? Mark 14 verses 1 through 9, listen. After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread, and the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft and put him to death, speaking of Jesus. But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar of the people. And being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. And she break the box and poured it on his head. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, Why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence. And have been given to the poor. 
and they murmured against her. And Jesus said, Let her alone, why trouble ye her? She hath wrought a good work on me, for ye have the poor with you always. And whensoever ye will, ye may do to them good. But me ye have not always. She hath done what she could. She has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. We're talking about it today. Mm -hmm. In the other Gospels, we read an account of this same experience, and it explains how that she was weeping. And she literally fell down at the Lord's feet and allowed her tears to fall on his feet. And then she took her hair and she began to wash his feet and wipe his feet with her hair. I remember as a kid, I often thought to myself, Lord, I, I don't quite understand this. Either she's kinky or something's going on here. But this week, I understood something that I've never understood before. In the passage that I read to you just a moment ago, Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 10, and verse number, I gotta look, 15. He said, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, listen, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How beautiful are the feet of them she washed his feet and wiped them with her hair. How beautiful are the feet of them who preach the gospel of peace and bring good tidings. Hallelujah. Oh, God, now I understand it, Lord. Now I get it, Lord. Jesus had the most beautiful feet on the planet by God's standard. Hallelujah. He didn't come bringing a word of condemnation. Mm -hmm. He didn't come bringing one word of guilt mongering. He didn't come bringing one word of fear. He must have had the most beautiful feet that have ever walked on planet earth. Hallelujah. And she wanted to be near those feet. Hallelujah. She wanted to wash those feet. She wanted to express her repentance. She wanted to express her appreciation. She wanted to, to express her gratitude for those feet, hallelujah, that brought the gospel to the world. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you now. In our primary text, the Lord went on to talk about a parable of the lost sheep. Said you got one sheep lost, you may have 99 others, but if you've got one lost, you're going to leave the other 99 to fend for themselves. You know why? Because as long as they stay together, they'll be fine. But you got one separate, you got one out there by itself, it is going to fall victim. It is going to become prey. It is going to experience calamity. I better find that one. Jesus never lost sight of his mission. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and the sinners for to hear him. He never lost sight of his mission. My mission is to seek out and to save that which was lost. You can't do that by keeping company with the saved. You can't do that by preaching against the others. You can't do that by not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, a message of good tidings, a message that brings hope and help and healing 
and deliverance to those who are bound and those who are lost and those who need deliverance. Oh my God, have mercy, folks. Have we got this thing all wrong? Have we been doing this thing all wrong? We've been preaching to the choir. Yep, that's right. We've been preaching to the choir. When God wants us preaching to the world. Mm -hmm. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. Lastly today, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the wrong passage. Luke chapter 7, verses 33 and 35. Jesus said, For John the Baptist came neither eating bread, nor drinking wine, and ye say he hath a devil. The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man, and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. Verse 35. But wisdom is justified of all her children. The byproduct of wisdom, the byproduct of acting wisely, behaving wisely, preaching wisely, just proves that doing it the way we did it was the right way to do it. Wisdom is justified of all her children. You want to know if that preacher was acting wisely? I remember Brother Gillum. I'm almost done today. I remember Brother Gillum. If there's anything I can say about Brother Gillum, I'm going to tell you right now. That man preached Jesus. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. Every Sunday. The reason that church had the move of God and had the move of the Holy Ghost it had is because they didn't stand there talking about those people over there and those people over there. They were too busy talking about, look what the Lord hath done. Look what the Lord hath done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time. And the church was shouting and was celebrating and dancing in the aisles because of the goodness of God, because of God's mercy, because of God's grace, because they celebrated their faith in the gospel. They celebrated what the Lord had done for them. They weren't busy condemning those people over there. And let me tell you something, when people needed God, they knew where to go. There's a young lady, she was the daughter of one of the church members there. She had a bad drug habit, bad problem. For many, many years, this young girl was in terrible condition. Finally, one Sunday, she decided, I've had enough. I need help. Did she go to AA? No. Did she go to rehab? No. She went to Riverside Church of God. She walked into that church that receiveth sinners. Yes. And when that young lady wanted to go down to the altar, several, oh hallelujah, several of those old time holiness Pentecostal women with their hair piled high and their sleeves on long tummy, they got around her in that altar and they prayed with her and they prayed for her until God poured out the Holy Ghost from heaven and that little girl received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and begun to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave her the utterance and she was instantly delivered delivered from her drug addiction that very day. Her relationship with her mother changed that very day forever. Oh, I want to tell you something, folks. If you do this thing right, if you preach the right message, if you preach for the benefit of the right audience, you will change our world. Absolutely. If you keep doing it the way you're doing it now, I'm going to tell you a little secret, and I'll end with this thought. You'll still be here preaching the same tripe you've been preaching, acting the same foolish way you've always been acting. 
after the Lord has come and redeemed from this old world his true church. I'm going to tell you a little secret, folks. There's still going to be a church in the world after the rapture. I didn't say that God's church was still going to be in the world. I just said there's still going to be a church in the world. Oh, there's going to be all kinds of denominations. There's going to be all kinds. And they're going to be swearing up and down that the rapture did not take place. See, in the movies that they make about the rapture, they never talk about this. They never talk about the fact that there are going to be millions and millions of people who claim to be Christians who are still going to be here. So therefore, they are going to be saying, oh no, it wasn't the rapture that took place. It couldn't have been the rapture because if it had been the rapture, I'd have gone up in it. There's only one way to do this thing and it's God's way. Right. And God's way is not preaching to the choir. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon as we close our service? Mm -hmm.